<clears throat> Hi, and welcome to a video lecture for day six of our human relations course. Uh, today we're going to be discussing communication with people and multiculturalism. So this is covered in chapter seven and eight in our human relations textbook. So starting with chapter seven, uh, we're talking about communication. So communication at its very most basic is the sending and receiving of messages. So this involves three major steps. The first step is that the sender encodes a message. They're organizing their ideas into symbols such as words or gestures. Um, so not all sent messages are going to be in the form of language, right? We're not always going to be um, speaking with somebody, right? Um, and a lot of communication is nonverbal as well. So even when you are speaking with someone, they can definitely have um, different mannerisms or body language that tells you maybe they're saying the, the something else. So for example, um, a client might be, um, when you ask them a question, okay, so is, is, do you have any questions? Do you understand everything? And they might say, uh, no, I don't have any questions but really they do have questions, they just don't wanna look dumb. And you can tell because they have a really confused look on their face, maybe they're subtly shaking their head no. Uh, those are signs that someone is, um, is experiencing confusion, right? Um, so uh, in those situations, we wanna read their body language more so than what words they're saying. Because if we, if we just take them at their word, no, they don't have any questions, and we don't acknowledge the fact that they look confused or worried, um, we're missing an opportunity to, to deepen our communication and help that client to understand better. So uh, after the sender has encoded their message, the sender needs to uh, choose their communication medium. Uh, so we wanna choose the medium most suited for the message. If it's a you know, a quick checking in, maybe an email is okay. If we wanna have a more of a conversation, um, uh, you know, get better feedback or more immediate feedback from a client, uh, telephoning them might be better. Um, if they have important news to hear from the doctor, perhaps their animal has a severe illness or has passed away, uh, we might wanna choose to have an appointment to have a face-to-face -face meeting. So uh, the communication medium needs to be chosen carefully based on uh, what is most appropriate. Um, so we talked about before sending like a, a firing letter to a client. It wouldn't be like if you have like, let's say text message enabled clinic, it would not be appropriate to send a text message telling them don't come back to the clinic. You would want to do that formally through a letter. And then lastly, the receiver uh, receives the message and decodes it. Um, so this is a process of them understanding the message, and this is where we'll, we'll often find barriers to communication. So I'm sure we've all met somebody who we have a hard time reading, right? So maybe they um, are very sarcastic, they're a sarcastic person, and we're, we're just not sure if they're being sarcastic or they're being serious when they say something. Um, so that can be, you know, one of the barriers that we end up seeing. Sometimes people just aren't very good at encoding their message. Sometimes we're not good at decoding the message. Sometimes um, there are like cultural barriers, which we'll talk about um, in our next uh, slideshow. <clears throat> so this is just a little visual of that. Um, so seeking feedback or a response is gonna help the sender to evaluate how effective their message got across. And when we're the person receiving the message, if we're able to um, paraphrase or repeat back what the sender is saying, we can confirm our understanding as well. So that feedback goes both ways. Uh, and then up here we see that there's this looming cloud over the um, communication, and that is potential barriers to, I think that's supposed to say the communication loop, <laughs> not uh, loom. But anyways, one example might be improper timing, right? So, um, you know, Client, clinic owner just had a really hard conversation firing a client or having to let someone know that their pet is going to die or something. Um, maybe now's not the time to go talk to them about getting a raise, right? So you want to kind of pick your timing for it to be appropriate. Um, there's lots of barriers to communication. Um, definitely a language barrier is going to be an issue. So if the two people trying to communicate don't speak the same language, that will be problematic. Um, 
use of like slang or jargon terms is going to be really confusing for owners. We talked about this back in our office procedures course, but remember we don't want to use terms like, um, you know, let's get the dog fixed. We want to say spayed or neutered. We don't want to say, oh, we'll give them a shots. We're going to say, we're going to give vaccinations. Um, we want to be really clear in the words that we're using. We won't say, oh, the doctor ordered a UA and a CBC. We'll say the doctor's ordered a blood, well, a urine test and a blood test. So we're not going to use those jargony terms because we're going to really confuse the owners they, or the clients. They're not going to know what the heck we're talking about. Uh, another potential barrier would be... Um, <sighs> like uh, disabilities can be a, a barrier. I've had to, um, like where we've had clients that don't um, hear very well or don't hear at all. And those can be challenging. Um, so you might need to adjust like the tone, the volume or the speed of how you speak uh, so that they can understand you better. Or in the case where they can't hear you at all, you might need to resort to like writing notes on a piece of paper kind of thing. So you have to sometimes get a little bit creative on how to make that communication happen, especially if you have someone that has uh, any kind of challenges in that area. Uh, so decoding the message leads to action, right? We get, as the receiver, uh, we're able to do what the sender wants. Um, we're able to make sure that uh, we can understand what they're saying. Oh, this is another barrier, actually. I didn't think about this. Um, but another barrier to communication can be um, noise or interference, right? So if you have owners that are um, distracted by their pets, like it's always a good idea to get, if you're discharging an, a, a patient, to give the owner all the instructions with the pet still in the treatment area in their kennel. Because if you bring the pet up right away, they're so hyper-focused on the pet, they're not really hearing anything that you're saying. So that is definitely, um, that, that distraction is a barrier to communication. Lots of noise can be really distracting as well. Uh, I've talked about noise levels in the clinic can sometimes be uh, very distressing, both for employees and for owners. If you have an animal in the back that is like, <laughs> and like really crying, that can really freak owners out. They're like, is that my pet? They're super distracted by those noises. If there's like lots of banging and weird sounds coming from the treatment area, the owners are concerned that something that something's happening that shouldn't be. If possible, it's nice if we can keep our uh, reception and waiting areas fairly quiet. It's going to keep the owners, or I mean, keep the animals more um, stress free, and it's not as distracting for the owners when you do need to communicate with them. Um, they talk about just different types of barriers here, physical barriers. So yeah, if you like are talking over, um, a desk or something, sometimes that can feel impersonal and that might feel like a barrier to communication. Um, just, uh, physical in terms of like not being able to hear as well. Psychological, sometimes people are just, um, not in a place to understand you. Um, you know... If, I, I'm just trying to think of clients that are kind of difficult clients. Um, like maybe clients that are older have like cognitive dysfunction. That can be a bit of a barrier to communication. They have a harder time understanding what you're trying to say. Um, or it, sometimes you have people that are just difficult. They've already made their mind up that going to the vet is a waste of money and they don't want to hear anything you have to say. And in those situations, it can be really difficult to get that message across. So we would like to build relationships because we can uh, have better communication with, with a better relationship. In terms of, I don't want to super get into this like warm, cold, dominant, subordinate situation. But what I want to do get into is that in the vet clinic, building relationships is going to um, really enhance your communication with clients. If they really understand what we're trying to say, we are going to have better client compliance as well, which means better health for the pet. And that's ultimately our goal. So ways that we can increase um, relationship building in our practice is calling owners and pets by their names. I've given you guys some cheats already on how to do that. If you have a terrible memory and can't remember a name to save your life, just look at the schedule and see who's coming in next. 
If you see a, a beagle named Barney is up next, look for the beagle coming in and say, oh, is this Barney as he walks in? Oh, I'm so happy to see you, Barney, and be all excited. That really builds relationships. It makes people feel like they're really valued and that you want them to be there, that you're excited to see them. And that should be the case. We shouldn't even be acting. We genuinely, genuinely are excited to see these animals coming in. We wouldn't be in this business if we weren't excited about the animals, right? Um, it, uh, we can also like ask uh, questions of the owner and the pets. People love talking about their pets. Oh, what are your pet's favorite treats? Um, what kind of things does your pet like to do on a hot day? Um, you know, do they have favorite toys? Like asking things about their pets will really get people talking. And they love answering those kinds of questions. So when you do have people in the waiting room, if you don't have a lot of stuff to do, do that little bit of relationship building. Have little chats with them. Um, those kind of things can really go a long way. Um, and, and then remembering the things that you say as well, like if you, and, and again, if you have a bad memory, make a note. Um, the note is like the easiest hack in terms of having a poor memory. Make a note in the file. If you know that every time that the little poodle named Jackson comes in, he doesn't like the circle treats, but he likes the square treats, make the note in the file you know, he likes the square treats. And then next time he comes in, you can say, oh, I got square treats already for you, Jackson. I know you like those best. And then the owner's like, oh, wow. Those kind of things go a long way for relationship building. Um, we can enhance communication too with our owners by making sure that we have written communication to go home as well. Uh, I think it's like 30%. 30% I think is the retention rate of things that are spoken to you. So if you are in the vet clinic and you're going over um, discharge instructions or prescription instructions with the owner, they're going to go home and if you know you called them and asked them to tell you what you told them, they would be able to maybe repeat 30% of it. That's like the average. Some people might do better, some people might do worse. So it's important to have written communication to go home as well. It pays to have brochures available that discuss uh, different illnesses so that if an animal has a specific diagnosis, you can send that information home with them. Discharge instructions should always be written out. Uh, so not only are we gonna speak, go over them with them, we're going to have a physical copy with the writing to send home with them for them to consult if they have questions. Um, Prescriptions should always have labels on them so that it's really clear what directions they're using to give those prescriptions. So written communication will really help as well. I'm just skipping all of this. Okay, I touched on this a little bit already. Okay, so it is 93% of what we communicate is through nonverbal channels. So um, just the words that we say definitely have meaning, but you're going to be able to pick up a lot of other meanings by looking at the person's body, by listening to their tone of voice, their um, general appearances, their facial expressions, um, and even in the environment can, uh, can change how that message gets across. So body language. If you're communicating with an owner with crossed arms, not making eye contact, uh, looking away from them, your body turned away from them, you are sending them the message that they are an inconvenience and that you do not want to serve them. You have closed body language. We want to have open body language. So relax your arms, um, turn your body towards the owner, um, ha you know, have a smile, those kind of things go a long way for, for open body language. Our tone of voice, we would like to have, um, well, for one thing, we don't want to speak too quickly. I know I am really guilty of this. I speak, I think, way too fast. Every time I listen back to these message or these um, video lectures, I'm like, holy God, slow it down, Laura. But when I'm talking, I feel like I am going really slow. <laughs> So I'm, I don't know, this is one I struggle with is the speed of my voice. So I, wanna, I don't wanna speak too quickly. I also don't wanna speak too slow. My dad, I think is such a slow talker. He talks and he tells a story and he's, he has these huge pauses and you're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, 
Uh huh. Okay, get on with it, right? So we want to try to strike that balance. We want to talk um, at a decent volume as well. We don't want to be shouting at our clients, but we don't want to be too soft or quiet that they can't hear us. So we want to speak appropriate to the environment we're in. And this is one reason why I say, if you're having a one-on-one -on -one chat with an owner, just get them in a room. It's nice and quiet if you can go into an exam room and you know go over your discharge instructions, go over the bill, anything like that where you're having more of an in-depth conversation. It's not just like your total $17, thank you, bye. Uh, it's a good idea to get them into an exam room because the environment isn't gonna be as noisy so you don't have to try to talk as loud. There's less distractions so you guys can really focus. Um, and then we wanna pay attention to our tone of voice too. We want a nice, open, friendly tone of voice. We don't wanna sound bored even if you've done these discharge instructions five times today already and 5,000 times in your career, you make it sound like this is the most important thing you've spoken about all day because you're talking to this owner about their pet and that is important to them. Even things that feel routine to us are not routine to the clients because they don't do them every day. So it's our everyday life, but it's not theirs. So we don't want to use, you know, slang or short terms, etc. And we want to not sound bored. If they ask questions, we want to like, you know, thank them for the question and answer the question as best you can or get someone who knows more to answer the question. We certainly don't want to bullshit. Owners smell bullshit a mile away. If you don't know what you're talking about, it shows. So go ahead and get someone's help if you don't know how to answer the question. Ask a tech, ask another VOA, ask a doctor, even get one of those other people to speak with the owner. But don't try to fake your way through because if you don't know, you don't know. And honestly, you might even end up giving harmful information. We certainly do not want to answer questions in a way that sounds condescending or makes the owner feel like you're shaming them or make them feel stupid. People are not going to return to a clinic that makes them feel like an idiot for trying to ask questions and take care of their pets. Even if it's something that you feel like should be really obvious, we don't want to make owners feel that shame. I'm trying to think of an example. I've worked with one woman who is very, I think, condescending towards owners when they ask questions about vaccinations um, or like deworming protocols for puppies and kittens. I don't know, she just assumes that everyone should know these things, that you should have done the research before you get a pet or something. But I mean, it doesn't always happen that way. So do we want to empower our owners to be able to do the best that they can? Or do we want to shame them that they, about something they didn't know? Um, I mean, that's a rhetorical question. We want to empower them. We want to educate them so that they can do better in the future. Or like if owners have done something, okay, so, this happens a fair bit. Cats, long hair cats come in and the owner's not doing any brushing with them and their hair, their fur's really matted or something. Um, I always approach that like, I want to give that owner education. I want to communicate to them that this is really uncomfortable for the cat, that it can cause harm to the animal and that we want to make sure um, that the animal is treated better in the future. So I'm not gonna go up to them and use a snotty voice and say, um, you know, you're really harming your cat here that like you, when you're, when you're leaving them all matted like this, it really hurts their skin and you can tear their skin and causes them a lot of pain. I want to go up there and be like, Ooh, so you know what? I found a few mats. Um, sometimes it's a little bit tricky to get long hair cats groomed. Do you think brushing at home is something you could do? And then they might share with me like, no, I can't. I have arthritis. I can't hold a comb. Um, in which case I can find other solutions. Um, maybe they'll be if the cat's actually really nasty to me. Again, we can try to come up with some other solutions. But if they are open to hearing that one, um, I can talk to them about how brushing will help their cat and I can treat them like, hey, you might not have known. Um, here's something you can do to do even better by your animal. We don't wanna shame them though. We don't wanna be like, you should have known because that's not, um, that's not a kind way to speak to people and it really puts them off. We also wanna watch our facial expressions. Our facial expressions shine through in how we speak. If we have a smile on our face when we answer the phone, hello, thanks for calling Robertson Animal Hospital. This is Laura speaking, how can I help you? You can hear it in my voice that I have a smile. If I answer the phone, 
Hi, thanks for calling Robertson Animal Hospital. This is Laura speaking. How can I help you? I sound bored. I sound annoyed that my day was interrupted by a phone call. I'm not building a relationship. I'm sending a message that I don't want you here and I don't want you calling. So be really careful about your facial expressions. Eye rolling on the phone is never ever appropriate. Eye rolling in person is absolutely not ever appropriate. I think people think they can get away with it on the phone because the owner can't see them. But if someone asks you a question and then you roll your eyes and answer, you're gonna have kind of a sarc sarcastic tone in your voice. So really watch those facial expressions. We wanna be open and friendly and kind to the clients that we're speaking to. And then environment, I, I already kind of touched on this, but if possible, it's nice to choose um, an exam room. Exam rooms also give you the benefit of not having a desk between you. So when you're standing on one side of the desk and the client is standing on the other side of the desk, it feels impersonal. Um, if we can even just get up out of your chair and walk around to their side of the desk, uh, it's much more uh, personable. It's a better way to communicate. So when you're um, on either side, it feels oppositional, right? Um, you're standing off across each other. Uh, I'm just gonna hang up that phone. It's just like a junk call. Sorry. Um, so it feels impersonal if we're standing uh, across a table from someone. Um, but if you're able to get onto the same side, it feels like now we're on the same team. We're in this together to take care of your animal and do the best that we can. So if I'm going over um, an admittance form in the morning to admit an animal, I'm always gonna come around from the desk. I'm not gonna stay um, you know, on, the, on my side with like the phone and the computer. I'm gonna go around to the client's side or I'll ask them to join me in an exam room. And in the exam room, I'm gonna stand, I probably won't stand on the same side as them um, just because that gets kind of crowded in an exam room, but I won't stand on the opposite side. I'll stand, um, you know, to like to the side of them so that we're looking, so we're looking at the paper from the same direction and we're able to um, go over those things together as opposed to me presenting it to them. I wanna do it together. So that environment can really um, affect your communication as well, your environmental choices. Um, and then of course you wanna look at the whole body, right? Um, and be able to pick up on um, people's attitudes and nonverbal communication as a whole. So if someone has a really friendly facial expression, they are making eye contact with you, they have um, a friendly tone to their voice, but their arms are crossed, they might just be cold, right? So sometimes there are signals that don't um, reliably indicate a particular attitude. You wanna look at the whole body. And that applies when we talk to uh, animal body language as well. Just one uh, sign isn't necessarily the sign. We wanna look at the whole body. Um, so we do definitely send messages with, um, with our environment and our appearance. Um, so in terms of like personal appearance, we do want to look neat and tidy. We don't wanna be covered in hair. This is something um, that is I feel like an unspoken thing in vet clinics, but I make the point of just going ahead and speaking it to my students because if you don't know, you don't know, but you should not be sitting up at the front desk with hair all over your clothing. You definitely shouldn't be speaking with clients if you have like blood or urine or feces on your clothing. Your scrubs need to be appear clean all the time. Uh, we go through a lot of those sticky lint rollers in vet clinics, but it's necessary to maintain that professional appearance. Um, depending on the type of clinic you work at, different people have different rules in terms of like, you know, tattoos and piercings and jewelry, etc. Um, or like funky hairdos or colors. I mean, work at the place that suits you. If you are a person that likes to be very expressive with your appearances, um, work for a clinic that's understanding of that and allows you to have that personality. There are some places that are gonna have those, um, I feel like kind of old school um, approaches to professionalism that like tattoos and piercings are um, inappropriate. But honestly, um, I think at this point, I feel like if you don't have a tattoo, it's kind of, that's the anomaly, right? Um, I don't think tattoos are just for like bikers and criminals anymore. Lots and lots and lots of people have tattoos. 
same with jewelry, etc. Ideally, though, we would like to keep things um, like non-offensive, right? So maybe don't wear your earrings with like, I don't know, the middle finger on them or something. You know what I mean? Like don't wear offensive things. Um, don't wear your hoodie with like, um, I don't, I'm trying to think, my husband, had, like Venom, Venom, my husband likes heavy metal. He's got this Venom shirt that I, when we had kids, I was like, just put it away, please. It's like really offensive. It's something about like, I don't even know. I'm not even going to get into it. But um, maybe like leave those kind of things at home and get like the plain black hoodie to wear to work, that kind of thing, okay? So be careful about um, your personal appearances. People are sometimes put off by people that look differently than they do. Um, so if you are a pretty clean cut person and you see someone that's like, yeah, got the funky hairdo, people might be like put off by that. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I personally feel like live your life, right? But um, there are some people that are kind of put off by, uh, by that. So we do want to have that level of professional profession professionalism to us. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, so here we're just talking about um, like the distance between the two people communicating. I've kind of talked about this already. Closeness kind of indicates interest and warmth, right? So getting onto the same side of the table with the owner um, or being at the same level with the owner. If I am um, going through a bill and the owner is standing up, I want to be standing up as well. Um, I want to kind of mirror what my owner or the client is doing because if I'm just sitting down in my chair, it kind of seems like I'm disinterested. So we want to kind of maintain that uh, physical proximity, well, as much as we can. Obviously, during the social distancing time, don't get all up in people's faces. Um, but when we are able to, that closeness is um, going to indicate more interest, more warmth, and make it more personal. Uh, we should make a note, though, that some cultures are more comfortable with closer contact than others. So we also want to be careful that we are not, like, offending anybody, right? Um, again, you can kind of, like, read people's responses. If you're ever unsure, I don't think it hurts to ever ask, right? Getting consent is a wonderful, beautiful thing, and it's easy to do. Is it okay if I come around and join you on your side of the table? Okay, great. You know, just ask the question if you're not sure. Um... Oh, we kind of went over like have physical posture and facial expressions and eye contact. Um, so I'm just going to kind of cruise through those. And then voice quality we talked about as well. Um, so we, we want to be careful with our tone, our volume, our um, pitch, our rate, etc. So we often com encounter communication roadblocks, especially in the vet clinic. Because um, these things happen most when communication is complex, going over medical instructions or um, estimates or, um, you know, disease processes. Those are all complex things to go over. Those are things we're talking about with clients a lot. Uh, when the communication is emotionally arousing, hmm, I think we've talked about this a couple times. Clients in the vet clinic tend to be a lot more emotionally charged than other, other situations. People at the grocery store aren't breaking down because they didn't have cherries on sale. Uh, people in the vet clinic are breaking down because if they can't afford to buy the food, they can't feed their pet. Um, if they can't afford the treatment, they can't help their pet to feel better. Um, and like worst case scenario, their pet might die. So people are very, very emotionally aroused in the vet clinic. So that can make communication more challenging. And then as well, if the communication you're offering clashes with the receiver's mindset. So I spoke about this, where owners just might not be in a place to want to understand you. Maybe they've already made a decision that veterinarians are quacks or that they know more than they do because they Googled it before they came here. Um, Maybe they just don't believe in, like let's say an animal has kidney failure or something, so you're recommending a kidney diet, and they just plain don't believe in kibbles because they wanna feed raw food. Um, whatever the situation is, if they don't want to hear your message, they're, they're not gonna hear your message. So you need to get creative on how you're gonna communicate that with them. 
Okay, so here are some examples. So uh, having a limited understanding of people. We've, so our whole first week of this course is doing that self-exploration. What's your emotional intelligence like? Um, you know, what's your self-concept like? Having an understanding of yourself contributes to an understanding of other people. Possibly this could be a cultural understanding as well. Um, oh, just even, even like province to province, there's going to be cultural differences. Never mind country to country. Um, so there's definitely different approaches to everything all around the world. Um, and that can help or hinder our understanding. Uh, a one-way communication. Are you talking with the client or are you speaking to the client? So we want to be careful about that. I like to approach um, almost everything I do with clients as a conversation. Uh, so I have a, I, when I'm gathering a history, I make it like a conversation. It's not an interview, it's a conversation where I'm just learning more about the animal. Um, and we'll talk about taking histories a little later on. Not today, but in, in a different course. Um, we want to have a conversation about like treatment plans. We don't want to just talk to the owner about it. Uh, sometimes people have different interpretations of words. Um, also when we're including jargon or slang terms, that makes it difficult to understand what we're speaking of. Um, we want to really be careful with those in the vet clinic. We need to put your animal to sleep to do a dental. Lots of people use the word put to sleep to mean euthanize. So if I use the words put to sleep to mean anesthesia, I might really confuse and scare the owners. So we want to be careful to use our correct terminology. We will need to put your animal under anesthetic for a dental. So then there's no confusion. The credibility of the sender and mixed signals can be communication roadblocks. Um, again, and I'm not saying it's right, but sometimes people um, might have an attitude that like if you have like funky hair or like a nose piercing or something that uh, you aren't credible that I'm not saying again I'm not saying that is the case but uh, people might have that perception and that will be a communication roadblock honestly if someone's treating you that way I would probably get someone else to speak with them there's no point in buttoning your head against that wall uh, there could be a distortion of information um, especially like don't try to bullshit your way through here because that can really confuse people or just give them the wrong information. Sometimes owners aren't really sure, um, they're, they're not understanding things properly and they're coming from their own histories and trying to interpret things through that. Um, and that's not gonna be uh, helpful for good communication either. So um, sticking to the correct factual information is gonna be the best case. Uh, different perspectives and experiences, that, that's kind of what I was speaking to, right? If they're trying to interpret what's happening based on things that have happened in the past, um, it, they might not be making the right conclusions. Emotions and attitudes, absolutely. Really upset owners are harder to communicate with. Whether they're upset with you or they're just upset about the situation, it is harder to get your, um, your point across. Improper timing. Well, I gave you an example earlier of like talking to your boss about a raise. Um, you know, don't, don't talk to the owner about getting a new puppy at a euthanasia appointment, you know, things like that. It's just like, it's not the right time. Um, don't, you know, you know, people be like, oh, too soon. If you make a joke about something like take time, take, let the owners take time, especially around euthanasia things. Um, communication overload. So if we are just slamming an owner with information, uh, it's, it's best if we can kind of pace it out a little bit. Uh, we schedule um, diabetic consults for newly diabetic patients and myself as a technologist do these a lot. So what I'll do is I'll go into the room with the owner and I'll start going over the information. I give them what information, what is diabetes, what causes it, how do we treat it. Um, and then if they're open to it, I will also include information about doing a blood glucose curve at home. But if an owner is already overloaded with my first part of the conversation, talking about diabetes and how to treat, I'm gonna just focus on that treatment stuff because that has to happen right away. The blood glucose curve doesn't need to happen for two more weeks. I can get them to come back for a second session and speak about those things then if they want to. They don't even have to talk about those at all. They could just get us to do it. 
So I, I want to be careful with that, that I'm not totally overloading an owner when I'm giving them information. It's okay to let them take a break, process what they've heard, what they've learned, ask questions, and then move on. Um, and it is totally okay to book more appointments to get through the stuff if it's too much for them at once. And communication overload is one thing that having written communication will help too. So I go over all that stuff with the owners. I also send them home with a booklet that says everything that I just said so that they're able to go back and say, oh, I feel like when I was talking to Laura, she said something about the food. I don't remember what it was. They can open up the book and read the section on food and be like, oh, right, it was this. So written communication really, really helps. Uh, so poor communication skills um, or poor listening skills will be roadblocks as well. Um, I don't necessarily think that an accent is a poor communication skill, I, but I do think that accents can be a communication barrier. I think there's lots of people too that are just dead set on not understanding accents. Um, I don't know if it's like a subtle racism thing or what, but um, I don't think it's that difficult. You just have to focus more and try a bit harder, right? To understand people with an accent. Uh, I don't think it is hard to ask, um, like ask politely um, for, for like the person to repeat themselves if needed to. Um, and then poor listening skills. So uh, I always say to people, we need to listen to understand, not to respond. So we want to um, really try to understand what the owner is saying and, and hear their message. And owners should be doing that as well. There are owners, though, that are very poor listeners. Uh, I've ha definitely had owners, like, checking their Facebook and stuff while I'm talking to them. And I'm like, can you put your phone away, please? <laughs> why, why am I even here? If you don't want to hear it, I don't have to. Well, I do have to say, but I, if you don't want to hear it, like, give me a break. And then cultural and language barriers as well. And those, I think, are fairly obvious. If you don't speak the same language, it's going to be tricky to get your message across. So building bridges, this is that relationship building. We want to appeal to human needs and, um, and their time. So we want to, um, you know, book appointments accordingly so that we aren't making people wait. Uh, we want to try to be as efficient as we can so that people don't have to spend what they feel like is extraneous time in the vet clinic. We want to meet their needs as well. Have a bathroom available that's clean. Uh, have beverages available if they're at the clinic for a longer time. Um, have little treats for the pets. Meet those needs if we can. Uh, have an empowered attitude and be persuasive, like be friendly, uh, etc. Repeat a message using more than one channel. This is something we can do a lot in the vet clinic and we can really help drive our message home. Uh, often our message is going to be recommendations for the pet's best health. So as the VOA, you can talk about those things with the owners in the waiting room or as you bring them into the exam room. We can have um, informational posters or TVs with slideshows going, making those re recommendations in the waiting room. We can have posters in the, um, in the exam rooms as well. If the um, tech is speaking with the client, we can reinforce those messages. The doctor can reinforce those messages. Uh, so there's stats out there that it takes um, three repetitions for uh, clients to actually start considering a recommendation. So let's say an animal is overweight and we need to recommend weight loss. If you mention when you weigh them, hey, it looks like Sparky's gained quite a bit of weight. We might want to talk about a weight loss program with the doctor. I come in, I do a body condition score. I say, actually, it looks like he's about a five out of five. So that is fairly heavy we would like to see him uh, more of an ideal body weight and talk about that with them. And then when the doctor comes in and makes the recommendation, hey, looks like Sparky's really overweight. Let's try to get some weight off him. We can really help with those joints, really help with diabetes, etc. The owner's finally in a place where they can hear that message and take that recommendation. So using more than one channel helps to reinforce the message. Um, you can discuss differences in frames of reference. It's helpful, especially with like um, cultural differences to know what the person expects and, and uh, see if you can meet those expectations. We can uh, use feedback to check in with comprehension and feelings. 
It's really easy to do. Um, what questions do you have for me? How are we feeling about this? Those are easy questions to ask that are open-ended so that the owners can share their thoughts. We don't wanna say, um, do you have any questions? Because sometimes it's scary to people to say, yeah, I do actually. Because they again, people are really afraid of looking, looking like they don't know or that they don't understand. They don't wanna feel stupid. Um, and then talking about feelings as well, asking them how they're feeling about it. I don't, I wouldn't just say, so are you good? We want to say like, oh, how are you feeling about this? We want to minimize our defensive communication. It's easy to get defensive when, um, you know, owners have a bit of attitude about something. We'll immediately snap back. Well, it's really busy today. I've been working my butt off and we don't need to be defensive. Any kind of um, communication that is like a critique, we can look at as an opportunity to grow and to be better at our jobs and to deliver better care for the animals and the clients. We want to combat communication overload. Again, space out those appointments if needed. Um, have brochures and information to send home with the owner. If you need to prioritize certain aspects, maybe, maybe they're not in a place right now to really understand how kidney disease works, but they are in a place to understand how to treat it. Let's start treating it. Let that, let's, let's get that animal feeling better. And we can phone call them, you know, a couple days down the road and go over some other stuff with them or make another appointment. We can spread that stuff out. I can also send them home with brochures. When you're ready to learn more, have a read through these brochures. Give us a phone call with any questions. We're happy to help. Uh, use mirroring to establish rapport. Mirroring is something a lot of people just do subconsciously. But if you mirror the people that you're speaking with, um, you, um, you'll have a better conversation with them. So when you have the owners that are very serious, joking around is gonna make you feel seem frivolous. But if, you have, if you're serious as well, you're mirroring their approach, um, they're gonna be like, hmm, good conversation. That person's very serious, I like it. If you have someone that comes in joking right away, um, joke back with them, laugh at their jokes. People love when you laugh at their jokes. <laughs> so using that mirroring can really help to um, just mirror back what they're doing and, and, and it makes them feel like, oh wow, what a great conversation. And when possible, we don't wanna spend a ton of time, um, you know, goofing off and gossiping and small talk with, our, with um, others, but like where appropriate, doing that small talk and, um, constructive gossip. Uh, it can be a good thing, especially with clients, um, so that we can, yeah, like get to know them and their pets. It makes them feel like they have a, a better relationship with the vet clinic. It's good to do that too with your coworkers within reason. We want to choose our places, right? You should not ever be chit chatting and gossiping at the front desk because that does not look very professional and it puts off the clients. Um, especially you should not be talking about clients or each other or anything at the front desk. And we want to avoid destructive gossip. So con constructive gossip might be like something, you know, someone made a mistake that we want to learn from. We can t chat about that. But, you know, de destructive gossip is, you know, the kind of malicious gossip. Oh my God, did you hear what whoever did? That's always a bad, a bad gossip. I think gossip's really bad in vet clinics too. I'm going to make a bit of a sexist statement here, but, um, I think, I think as, I think women kind of like to gossip a little bit more maybe than men and the vet world is definitely female dominated. So I find that gossip can sometimes really be a big problem. So we should avoid that gossip because it doesn't really help to build any relationships in the vet clinic. So we talked about communicating how to get our message out. Now let's talk about how to listen and be the person that takes the message in. So effective listening is all about being an active listener. Active listening involves actually listening and hearing what the person is saying. It doesn't mean that while they're talking, you're crafting your hilarious response. It doesn't mean that something that they said sparked a story that you'd like to share and then you're thinking about what had happened so that you could share that story. It doesn't mean that you're thinking about your grocery list or how soon you can check your social medias to see how many likes your last picture got. 
Um, it means you're focused on the person and their message at the time. Uh, so what we can do is hear what they're saying and paraphrase back to them to confirm that we're understanding. We want to make sure we're listening intensely. Um, active listening is just that. It's active. You have to put work into it. And we would like to use empathy as well. Um, have If someone's telling you like, you know, how hard it's been taking care of their pet, um, we don't we don't want to maintain that like friendly, uh, welcoming smile. We want to kind of have like our empathetic face, like, oh, oh, that's really, that does sound really hard, that kind of thing. So uh, empathy is a really important skill to have in the vet clinic. Um, when we are um, empathizing, we're understanding the other person's point of view. Um, empathizing, you can empathize and disagree with someone, you can empathize and not understand really where they're even coming from, but we can still have empathy that a person's position might be difficult or upsetting. It might not be what you would do, but we can still be empathetic. Um, so to be empathetic, we want to um, provide some feedback to the owner. Uh, so things like that does sound really hard, that is really difficult. Uh, we want to paraphrase so we can repeat back in our own words what the senders or what the person sending the message is saying, feeling, or meaning. Ideally, uh, we want to minimize distractions. That goes for when any kind of communication. When we're active listening, it's easier to do with less distractions. And we don't want to interrupt. Well, as best as we can. Sometimes you get owners that want to tell you their whole life story. Um, and at th those times, you might need to do a little bit of a redirecting to uh, keep them on track to talk about you know what's been going on with the pet um so well we've already talked about empathizing being very important and we want to minimize words that shut down discussions um and uh, often that's going to be those kind of condescending words that's going to just shut people right down and they're not going to want to talk to you anymore um, so we want to use open lines of communication with our clients so that we're not shutting them out of discussions. Uh, okay, so I do want to just touch on to our next one as well, um, which is about cultural differences. So chapter eight is developing intercultural competence. Um, so I'll let you read the chapter for kind of details here, um, but I do just want to touch on a few things. Um, so if you are able to develop an ability to work with a wide variety of people from diverse backgrounds and cultures, you are more likely to be successful in your job. Um, we want to avoid um, making anyone feel uncomfortable for who they are. We want to be welcoming of all peoples in our business. So cultural doesn't just necessarily refer to like what, you know, country or family um, originated from or something like that. Um, that's part of it, certainly. But culture also includes just like different types of people, different types of lifestyles. Um, so especially with dogs, there is a, like lots of different cultures of dogs, right? There's like the shelter rescue dog people where it's like, you know, a dog don't shop. There's the breeders that are really like all in on breeding a specific breed. I find that they're even different within different types of breeds. People that are like pug fanciers um, are very different than people that are like golden retriever fanciers or like little dog fanciers. There's just those different types of people even that like what dog breed they like. Um, different sexual orientations. Um, I don't like the term opposite sex. Let's go with gender, right? Different genders, uh, different religious affiliations and beliefs, people with disabilities, just all different types of people. We can come to a place where we want to, um, we want to be able to work well with them. So when we speak of culture, we mean a learned and shared system of knowledge, beliefs, values, attitudes, and norms. And that includes behaviors. Um, so basically, uh, how we learn about culture is passed from one generation to another, and typically it'll kind of flow within families or like friend groups. Um, and then we would like to be able to be able to connect with, um, all different kinds of cultures. 
Okay, so there's seven dimensions of different cultural values. Um, so uh, it's good to know that different cultures would have different weight placed on different things, right? So materialism versus concern for others. So some cultures are very focused on the, um, on the me, the what's in it for me. Um, other cultures are more concerned with um, like the greater good or um, that other people are taken care of and, and prioritize others first. So having kind of a, a culture of, um, of service versus, um, you know, taking, giving versus taking. Uh, some cultures are certainly more formal than others. Um, I feel like in Canada, we're fairly, um, fa honestly, fairly informal. Definitely, we want to have that pr level of professionalism. Um, but, I mean, I'm not generally, like, shaking clients' hands or something like that when I meet them. Um, I'm just going to acknowledge them and whatever. But I'm not, I don't have that level of formality with them. Uh, the acceptance of power and authority. So, uh, some cultures have that ex expectation um, that you expect or respect authority. Um, other cultures have a little bit more of an expectation of um, that, you know, you question, you question those in power. Uh, individualism versus collectivism. I feel like that kind of plays into what we already talked about, about materialism and concern for others. Urgent time orientation versus casual time orientation. Uh, if you've ever traveled like anywhere on an island that always talk about island time, right? Island time is a lot more of a casual, um, casual thought of time. So people from cultures that have a casual time orientation aren't necessarily super duper concerned about due dates or being on time for work or um, length of lunch breaks, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, cultures with a more urgent time orientation have the insistence that when the, we say seven o'clock, we mean seven o'clock. So I think, again, here in Canada, I think we have more of an urgent time orientation. Uh, work orientation versus leisure orientation. I think we are a capitalist society, so we skew towards that work orientation. Um, oh, leisure is my favorite, though. I would love to see more of a lean towards leisure. Um, and then high contacts versus low contact cultures as well. Um, so moving on then, some people have a multicultural identity and there might be intersections in their identity, right? So it might not just be, um, you know, it might not just be a cultural identity in terms of heritage. Uh, they might have gender identities or, um, or, uh, sexuality identities that all intersect. Um, so in that case, they might have values that kind of reflect all those cultures, any cultures that they're bringing to it. So in Canada, we certainly have um, a multicultural, cultural mosaic. We have all different people, all different types of people in our country here. And I think we should be welcoming and inclusive of all of them as best as we can. Uh, no one is saying that you need to do what they do, um, but you do, I think, need to show people respect. So you do not have to agree with, understand, or like anything that they do. Um, but you do need to be respectful of all people. Um, so barriers to effective intercultural communication. Um, if you're aware of conscious or unconscious barriers um, that you yourself hold, you can eliminate miscommunication. Um, sometimes it's hard to have that uh, close look at yourself and ask yourself the question, um, am I maybe being a bit racist here? Am I being maybe homophobic or, um, you know, discrimination of any type? It's sometimes hard to look at those questions because I think all of us like to think that we're nice people, but being nice, it's, it's not just about like being nice. Um, sometimes we do have those just kind of, um, subtle cultural things that we've learned that we've internalized and we have a bias so if you can identify that bias and then um just you know don't work within that bias you're gonna have better um communication with people so if you can like for instance i think like um some people i said have a really hard time understanding accents um i think that part of that is um an unconscious bias so if you can kind of overcome those things, recognize that maybe you are um, working from a place of assumption, 
then hopefully you can work around that. Also, um, knowing what different cultures uh, expect, we can, um, or we can kind of change what we do or um, how we come across so that we meet that perception, right? Um, so we want to be careful about stereotyping, um, even just not even just like negative stereotyping, but even positive stereotypes as well. Um, you know, sometimes certain cultures are associated with being smarter than others or dumber than others. Um, that's just a straight up stereotype and it's not going to be beneficial. So you can't just assume that someone will understand you because they are a certain culture. You also shouldn't assume that someone can't understand you because they are a certain culture. It basically expectations, or not expectations, I mean um, like stereotypes or uh, jumping to conclusions about people never serves you or the client well. Um, I think I kind of have talked about this before. I, I kind of make the joke that like my husband looks homeless. I mean, it's kind of a joke, right? But I'm, I'm teasing when I say that. But like, no word of a lie. <laughs> like he works in a factory and his work clothes, he'll wear like jeans and they're kind of like ripped up and dirty. And he um, is allergic to um, like nickels. So he has like a contact allergy. So he can't wear a belt. So he wears like, it's like a piece of yellow twine or whatever tied around his, so he has like a rope belt. And he, and he wears these t-shirts, but they're like, cause he works a, a hard job. They're often kind of torn, whatever. And um, people often would maybe make the jump that he's like lower class or not very smart or um, like homeless, like I've said. But uh, it's, that's just not true. That's just not true about him. Um, and so if you have a client that comes in looking like that and make the assumption that maybe they're poor and they can't pay or that they're not gonna understand how to take care of their animal, you're um, doing them a disservice, you're doing the pet a disservice and you're doing your business a disservice because that client's probably not gonna come back if they're treated like a second class citizen um, just because of your assumptions based on the way they look. So we need to be careful about stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. Uh, we really wanna make sure that we are not exercising any of those things in our clinic. Um, so ethnocentrism, that's just assuming that your way is the best way. Um, everyone, Everyone comes from different cultures and there is no right or wrong. Just there's difference and difference is beautiful. Um, we want to be careful about different norms and codes of contact, right? Especially if you will be working with a specific population, it might be beneficial to learn more about what they expect, um, what their, um, what that culture's, um, uh, like business expectations or customs are. And micro inequities or sometimes microaggressions, maybe you've heard that term. Um, these are something we need to be careful as well. This is when you might be very meaning, be, coming from a place of being um, like no offense, right? Like you're not trying to be hurtful. Um, but these little micro inequities can be really um, offensive to people and become really irritating. So uh, these are times typically the person saying the thing is unaware that they are slighting another individual and this can lead to changes in one-on-one -on -one relationships that could profoundly irritate others um so these the slighted people are often taught to confront the issue rather than let resentment build that's what we should be teaching i find a lot of the time people are scared to make the um statement of hey that can be offensive because they don't want to um you know aggravate the situation further Fortunately, I think we are living in a time right now where people are starting to speak out about stuff and that is great because no one should be left feeling um, like, you know, abused or whatever in a situation. Um, so one example that I've seen a lot um, is that, uh, um, you know, people like white people will be really into black people's hair. So they'll be like, oh wow, is that your real hair? Can I touch your hair? Um, things like that. And um, from what I've read, that's very irritating, obnoxious, and um, not welcomed at all. So um, that's just one example. There are plenty more that you can find. Um, if you do a little bit of uh, a little bit of Googling on microaggressions, um, you can find out a lot of different things that you might not realize are being offensive. Maybe you have the most, um, you know, good intentions, but that you know it might just be a sticky area and one to avoid um 
I don't want to super get into gender differences here. I feel like this also just focuses really heavily on men and women. And I would like to acknowledge that um, there is uh, quite a number of genders now that people are speaking of. And um, I don't think we need to just focus on that binary. Um, again, I don't care if you agree or disagree. You just have to be respectful to people. Everyone's a human. Treat them like a human. You don't need to know or care about their gender or their sexual orientation or anything, but we do need to be um, respectful. So I'm just kind of skipping through some of this. Um, I just, uh, I, I think we talk a lot about uh, men and women here. Um, so methods and techniques to improve your cross-cultural relations. Education is gonna be number one. Well, I think so. Um, develop cultural sensitivity and cultural intelligence. Read about things you don't know. If you see that consistently you have um, a very big, I don't know, like let's say Filipino population coming into your clinic, um, find out more about that culture and get to know, get to know that this beautiful group of people coming into your practice. Um, you can also focus on the individual rather than groups and like really, um, well, I've said already, number three, respect all people, all workers, all cultures, just respect everybody. Um, and if you're focusing on the individual rather than a group of people, you're not going to be as inclined to fall back on those inherent biases and stuff. We want to value cultural differences. Everyone brings something different to the table. And I think that's amazing. I don't think we all need to be the same. Uh, minimize cultural bloopers. And by bloopers, we mean like, um, things that might be offensive to other people. And then, um, participate in cultural and diversity training. Uh, so that kind of ties back up with number one is building that sensitivity intelligence knowledge, right? Knowledge is power. Education is key. Um, so we can actively seek information and knowledge about the culture that can help you to communicate effectively. Always, always, always with every person, we want to demonstrate empathy and respect. So that involves putting yourself into the other person's shoes, practicing your good listening skills, your active listening, um, attending to that nonverbal communication, and then really cultivate a belief that all other cultures are good. Having that difference, that it's, it's wonderful to have those different point of views. If you're ever unclear about expectations or etiquette, it does not hurt to ask. I don't think asking a question um, is, well, I guess some questions are offensive, but just like, hey, what are your expectations here? Um, I don't think is an inappropriate question. If you develop your cultural tolerance and sensitivity, um, we want to be aware of that, right? Uh, we don't want to have um, like a, you know, I don't see color, I don't see, we're all just one race, etc. kind of um, belief system because that erases those differences. And those are differences can be really beautiful and um, can really bring interesting things to the table here. So we want to have that openness to seeing people for who they are. Um, avoid negative judgments, right? If you find yourself going to um, a place of a quick snap judgment, that's probably something that has been ingrained in you um, through media, through your own culture, through your family culture, your values, etc. cetera. Um, but it does not hurt to question your attitude and learn new ways of thinking. So the first thing that you think is often that, um, that internalized bias but we can approach people from a more logical standpoint. So even if your initial response is something that's maybe kind of offensive or, um, or prejudice, we don't have to act on that initial response, right? We can use our brains and treat people with respect. And then of course, minimize those cultural bloopers. Don't be offensive. Don't make jokes in the clinic about religion or race or gender or sexual identity just um, make jokes about the weather or something. Like keep it clean, keep it um, very generic. Um, so you can develop cultural sensitivity and a cultural intelligence. Uh, so sensitivity is an awareness of and willingness to investigate and learn about differences in cultures. And then cultural intelligence is an outsider's ability to interpret someone's unfamiliar and ambiguous behavior. Um, so the three sources of cultural intelligence relate to cognitive, emotional, and motivational and physical aspects. 
Um, so basically we want to um, be able to use our brains to see um, like differences in people there um, and be able to translate that knowledge into actions. So barriers, basically be alert to the differences in customs and behavior, use straightforward language, speak slowly and clearly when the situation is appropriate. If you're able uh, to speak the person's language, do so. I think speaking different languages is such um, an amazing thing to be able to do. It's such an amazing skill. I don't speak any other languages besides English. And um, even like learning basic French in school was really, really difficult for me. I have nothing but respect for people that are um, new to Canada. Learning English, th that's amazing. You're amazing for being here and doing that. Um, so I like I know how much I struggled just with like basic French in like elementary and junior and high school. Um, I can't imagine having to live my life in a different language. So I think we always need to um, be giving those people, those English learners, um, benefit of the doubt and helping them as much as they can and being encouraging. And if you do speak their language, certainly um, offer to speak that because that's really amazing. Um, so again, with barriers, we want to be careful about difference in, um, in different etiquette, right? Different hand gestures might be um, rude in one culture versus another. I know um, lot, I've, I've seen, uh, I've worked with a number of Indian men, um, like they, um, like my vet clinic owner, he is from India and he and um, a group of other Indian veterinarians in the city have kind of like gotten together um, and like kind of pooled their resources for opening clinics, which is really cool. Um, but one thing that I've noticed that I'm assuming it's a cultural thing is that when they point, so if they're pointing to blood work, they always like point with their middle fingers. And um, here, right in Canada, like flipping someone off or it, like giving them the middle finger is like kind of like saying F you to them, right? So um, we've we've kind of spoken about um, maybe pointing with a, a different finger or two fingers, doing the two finger point is a little bit more polite because um, I wouldn't want anyone to feel put out. And meanwhile, it's just a cultural thing. So anyway, so we want to be sensitive to those differences in nonverbal communications as well. And then we don't want to uh, like focus on the message, not the style, the accent, the grammar, or the personal appearance. Grammar is not going to be great, especially when people are learning a new language. That's amazing that they're doing that. Give them some grace, okay? Grammar does not have to be perfect. And then we want to listen for understanding, not agreement or disagreement too. We don't want to listen to argue. Uh, listening is a powerful tool for coming over any communication barriers. Um, we want to be attentive to individual differences in appearance. Um, ask lots of questions to clarify misunderstandings. And do not misinterpret a formal communication style during a multicultural team meeting. Some people see that formality as maybe that, oh, I don't think that person likes me. It just might be a cultural thing that they um, they are come from a culture that likes to be more formal and how they speak to one another. So um, again, just ask questions. If you're not sure, um, learn more. There's, you know, knowledge is power and that's a beautiful thing. So basically my sum up here in terms of like different cultures is be respectful of all human beings and don't make snap judgments because that uh, can only lead to, to trouble. So thank you for listening to this video lecture. If you do have questions, make sure you reach out in the chat or um, in the virtual classroom, or you can send me an email. And um, that's it. I don't have anything else. Have a great day. Thank you.